Chapter 2 April 1614 It is early springtime. Outside the open window, the trees wear their lacy new green and the air is alive with insect sounds. I am four and a half years old. Inside our cottage, my mother is stirring a pot of bubbling cornmeal porridge over the fire, our midday meal. I'm standing on a chair, doing my best to pound corn into meal with one large mortar and pestle. My father arrives from working in the fields. Ah, my girls are cooking together, I see, he says. He stands behind my mother and wraps his arms around her. His hands come to rest on her slightly bulging belly. I glance at my parents and I'm surprised to realise what I hadn't noticed before. I flash them a huge smile. I want to say, oh, a new baby is coming, but I can't let on that I know and they obviously think it's too early to tell me. I just keep pounding corn and smiling. Pocahontas has been living in Henrico, a new outer plantation far from Jamestown Fort. We receive reports, mostly gossip, as to her well-being. She is happy. She is angry. She wants to stay with us. She wants to go home. She wears her new English clothes like a princess. She goes barefoot like a commoner under her long dresses. She reads the Bible. Reverend Whitaker has converted her to Christianity, and her new Christian name is Rebecca. She will always believe, in her heart, in those heathen gods of theirs, Ochius, Ahone, the Great Spirit. There is controversy over the ransom. Some say her father has paid some of it, but refuses to pay all of what Captain Argyll and Governor Dale demand. Others say that her father keeps paying all that they ask, but it's never enough. They always ask for more because they have no intention of allowing her to go home. Some say she's angry at her father. Others say she's furious at Governor Dale and Captain Argyll. The gossip continues. Rebecca is in love with John Rolfe. No, she's not in love. She misses her husband. Her marriage to Kakum doesn't count because it was not in a church. John Rolfe wants to marry her and Governor Dale has given his consent. The last piece of gossip, at least, about her marriage to John Rolfe turns out to be true. A wedding is planned to take place at the church in Jamestown Fort on April 5th. The day dawns warm and sunny. Reverend Buck wears his Sunday black suit. Everyone in the fort wears their finest clothing. For the gentlemen and their wives and children, this means ruffles and starched collars, velvet, lace and shined shoes. For me and my mother, it means newly washed and mended dresses and clean feet. For my father and Samuel, clean shirts. The Indians come too. Pocahontas' sister, Matachana, and her aunts and uncles, all with their beautiful feathers and necklaces of copper, shells and beads. There is a hush, as though, if someone says the wrong thing, this magical moment will dissolve, this moment of love and union between our two peoples. We're all tired of the fighting and bloodshed, we want this wedding to bring us peace. The better sort take their seats in the pews and we stand at the back of the church with other commoners. I can barely see Mr Rolfe at the altar with Reverend Buck waiting for his bride. Suddenly, everyone is on their feet, turning towards us. No, not towards us, towards her. Her black hair is pulled back, her dark skin against the scarlet of her mantle. She is accompanied by her uncle Oppit Chapham, who will give her away. She carries a bouquet of rosemary and wears a necklace of pearls, a gift from her father. She walks slowly, her face as unreadable as a blank stone. I desperately want to know what she's thinking and feeling. Is she happy to be marrying John Rolfe? Is she still grief-stricken that she can't go home to Kakum and her young son? I know I only have to touch her and the knowing will reveal at least some of her feelings to me. I reach out and brush her hand as she walks by. She doesn't even notice, but I have what I want. The blank stone becomes alive. She is determined, hopeful, nervous, interested, ready for the next step. Good, I think. She's making the best of what life has given her. I nearly doze off during Reverend Buck's long sermon. But when the wedding is over, when John Rolfe and Rebecca have been pronounced husband and wife, I'm wide awake. There is joy ruffling through the crowd as we file out of the church. Joy and hope. Men shake John Rolfe's hand and congratulate him. 
Rebecca's sister and relatives gather around her. When I see Samuel walking towards Rebecca, I trot after him. He wishes her well and grasps her shoulders as if he could put strength into them. Strength she will need, as the peace of two kingdoms rests on those shoulders. I tug on Rebecca's hand, so that she'll notice me. She looks down, and I can see that she still doesn't recognise me. Matoaka, I say. I can't think of anything else to say. She bends down and takes my face in her palms. Ginny, she asks in amazement. You're such a big girl now. I grin. Then, through her hands, a memory comes to me, almost as if it was my own. A day in her village, her baby son on her lap, her loving husband, Kakum, nearby. Her eyes fill with tears. I'm so sorry, I whisper. But it startles her and I realise I've said a very stupid thing on her wedding day. Um, I mean, be happy, be happy now, I say. She blinks, quickly wipes tears from her cheeks and laughs. Yes, Ginny, she says. Thank you.